refresher that we also have an event after this fantastic one from two o'clock to three o'clock with Ann McKinnon and Bill Blumquist um, today. So that's going to be a really great discussion around, around water governance in the rural American West. Um, so I hope you can join for that as well. I know it's a busy time of year, but two fantastic back-to-back um, -back events today. But first, Eric, welcome back to the workshop, your second home. Great to see you and Bernie. Thank you so much. <laughs> So a, a brief introduction, I'm Bernie Fisher, and uh, I'm going to introduce Eric Nordman, uh, who will highlight his, uh, his new book on, with, about Lynn Ostrom. A real short history of uh, Eric and Bernie. So in 2018, Eric was looking to, be, to become a visiting scholar at the Ostrom Workshop, and he realized that he needed to have a faculty colleague. Eric has a bachelor's degree in forestry. I'm a forester. And in around 2001, 1999. 19, 1999, he briefly worked for the Indiana Division of Forestry, where I was a state forester and director, way down the chain of command. So we really probably, he may have met me once, but I didn't remember. But he calls me up and he says, Hi there. Uh, I used to, yeah, I worked for you back way back when. I'd like to be at the workshop. Can we create a relationship? I said, boy, that sounds cool. You know, Forrester back to the workshop. And so uh, I did a little reading of his resume, everything he'd done, wrote, put together, you know, a, a support of his proposal. And uh, he arrived here in 2019 as a visiting scholar. Uh, he's since become a workshop affiliate. And his project was to write a book about Lynn Ostrom and the Commons. And so with no further ado, my friend Eric Norton will take over. Thank you very much, Bernie. And thank you everyone for uh, the warm welcome and inviting me back to uh, present the result of uh, that sabbatical as a visiting scholar. So uh, David, do you wanna share the slideshow? I will. Oh, right. So the, the origin of this uh, story, this kind of, um, yeah, this long journey uh, to writing about Lynn actually started uh, with a failure. I had proposed um, an EPA grant proposal. I'd written this EPA grant proposal with some uh, colleagues, and I was the lead on it. And um, it was about using uh, some of Lynn's work on collective action to look at the 2030 district energy program, uh, which Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I live, is one of the members of this. And it's a nationwide, actually international program, because there are some uh, Canadian cities as well, um, where communities and building owners voluntarily join and pledge to reduce their energy use and water use uh, by 50% by 2030. And uh, you know, it's not just an individual effort, there's a community that's built around it. So it really fit with this uh, theme of collective action. And I was excited to um, investigate uh, this using some of Lynn's ideas. Unfortunately, that was back at the end of 2016, beginning of 2017. And after we submitted, the EPA canceled all of their grant opportunities in, in a big review. Um, we got some great feedback on the project, but uh, there was no support for that. And this was, my plan was to, this was gonna be my sabbatical uh, project. So that left me with, well, what else, what am I going to do next? Like what's the, the next step? So I really like this idea of, you know, collective action. It was, um, Lynn's work was something that I had investigated a little bit before and teaching environmental economics and natural resource policy classes I've taught my undergraduate students a lot about Lynn's work, but I was not really an expert on it. I, as a graduate student, had read you know, Governing the Commons, um, but I thought maybe this was an opportunity to dive into her work uh, some more and maybe write a book that was accessible to uh, undergraduate and non, a non-technical audience. And there are some already some wonderful and excellent books out there by uh, Lynn herself and Vincent as well, um, and also about Lynn um, and her work on the Commons, but none of them really reached 
um, a non technical <laughs> audience. So governing the commons is a great, you know, scholarly resource. Vlad Tarko has written a really excellent intellectual biography that introduces, uh, Lynn, you know, really summarizes Lynn's work um, over her career. Um, but I think it's a, those books are pretty challenging for an undergraduate um, who might be interested in this topic. Um, and also, uh, John Andrus, Andrus and uh, Marco Jansen have a really great textbook on sustaining the commons. Um, but I thought there was, you know, Lynn's work is so interesting and her life is so fascinating that I thought they could maybe uh, there would be an opportunity for a book that has a more narrative uh, take, a storytelling take on her work and could introduce her ideas to a broader audience. So my goal for writing this book was really to inform readers about Ostrom's work, but also to inspire people to take action in their communities. And I really wanted to tell the story of Lynn's work from the perspective of the communities uh, that she studied. And I really um, took this, I borrowed this approach, frankly, copied it from Elizabeth Colbert's books. Um, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning author of Field Notes from a Catastrophe, and The Sixth Extinction, and her new book is Under a White Sky. And uh, she's not a scientist, she's a journalist, but in each of these books, she you know, goes to uh, talk to scientists, interviews them at their field sites and things like that, and tells the story of each of these uh, challenges from the perspective of the scientists and the scientific community. So that's kind of the idea that I wanted to use with, the, with this book about uh, Lynn Ostrom is to tell the story of Lynn's work, um, not just you know, in an academic sense, but to kind of convey the story from the perspective of the resource users. Um, so I spent the year as a visiting scholar here at the Ostrom workshop and uh, had great introductions to many people um, all across the country and around the world and who were very gracious in sharing their uh, stories and memories and uh, knowledge with me. Uh, so the result of, of this uh, year-long effort was the, my book, The Uncommon Knowledge of Eleanor Ostrom, Essential Lessons for Collective Action. Um, so it's 10 chapters long, and it covers um, her early years as a graduate student studying groundwater challenges in Los Angeles, and then follows her, the idea of the, her development of these ideas around the commons dilemma. Um, building on case studies like lobster fisheries, irrigation communities, forest commons, climate change and global commons, um, many of which you've contributed to. So I thank so, so many of you in the audience for sharing your, um, your stories with me. But I also wanted to apply some of, um, you know, look at the emerging topics where people are applying Lynn's ideas on, on new areas of study like space commons, cybersecurity, data, data governance, and information commons. Um, so um, yeah, it was a really interesting journey. These are, as a, like Bernie said, my background is in forestry. Um, so a lot of this stuff was really brand new to me. And um, so it was a really enjoyable um, challenge to write this book. And really there's no better way to learn about something than having to teach it to someone else. So that's really where this, you know, the essence of this book is, you know, trying to teach readers about her work. Um, so it was really fun and uh, very rewarding effort. So um, I also collaborated with a photographer, uh, Jason Reblondo. He's an uh, old friend of mine from high school who's now an, a professor of photography at Illinois State University in the other Bloomington. And uh, <laughs> We uh, took some uh, few trips, uh, research trips to Maine. Uh, we went to Spain. Uh, he, actually, he was already there. Uh, his wife was giving a presentation at a conference. So I uh, met up with him at the end of that trip. And we went to Valencia to uh, study the water court and uh, the Tribunal de las Aguas and the irrigation communities there. Um, we talked to people at the May Creek Farm here in Bloomington. Um, that's Ernesto, a farmer we met in Valencia. Um, there's another landscape from Valencia. So Jason took some really fantastic photos 
And um, so many of these are in the book, but he also put together a, uh, a photo exhibit. We had, Jason had a lot of photos, especially from our trip to Valencia, Spain. So he put together an exhibit that's um, on display now at my home university at Grand Valley State University. And then next semester we'll be uh, at Illinois State University where Jason, uh, Jason works. And it's called Canal by Canal. And it really uh, documents the operation of the <coughs> Valencia's um, irrigation communities and the Tribunal de las Aguas, their water court. So that was really fun. I would encourage you, if you have any sort of field work, you know, reach out to a, an artist or a photographer uh, who can document some of this stuff. That was really a lot of fun. So thank you very much for everyone who made this possible, uh, especially Bernie, everyone at the Ostrom Workshop, uh, Lee and Scott, and all the staff here, David, <coughs> uh, Allison, Gail, uh, my colleagues at Grand Valley State University, folks at Island Press, and all the interviewees that we met with, and also my family. So that went a little quicker than I thought. I think I've got to race through it. Um, but we that opens up a lot of time for uh, q and I, I didn't want to dwell too much on the content since you most of you in the audience are probably Ostrom experts and you've, you know this stuff. You actually helped write the book through your interviews. Um, but yeah, we can open it up for uh, Q&A if anybody wants to hear more about how the book was written or particular topics that are in there. Stop sharing. Sure. Hey, Eric, maybe, maybe I could just start with a really, you know, basic question. Sorry, I, I am still coming down. <laughs> you can probably hear my laugh from up here. It's sad. Um, I was just wondering, you already knew the, the, um, the context to some of the backstory, I think, pretty well. What, what were some of the biggest surprises that you ran across and kind of especially researching perhaps some of the, the early work, you know, back in the 70s? Um, it just anything that immediately comes to mind. I'd love to. I'd love to learn more about because those were some of the periods we wrestled with for the children's book we worked on last year. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question. And one of the challenges um, or the interesting detective pieces was how did Lynn make this transition? You know, from well, she was working on LA groundwater as a ground graduate student and then moved into municipal governance through the 70s. And then it kind of seems like, well, all of a sudden she comes out with, um, you know, governing the commons. And I was like, well, how did, you know, what happened between 1970 or, you know, 1980 and 1990, you know, during that decade, how did she make that switch? So um, did a lot of document, you know, documentary searching for old reports and uh, connections to, uh, to various uh, colleagues of hers. And um, I guess that really, they, it was Jim Atchison and Meg McKeon, I think. Um, and there were some other folks who connected Lynn, some of her former graduate students um, with this National Research Council effort that was looking at the Commons Challenge and uh, she got connected in the early 80s with that group. And that's really, that connection really set her off on this, this path that, uh, you know, led here and all of us being here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I wondered, uh, the metropolitan governance stuff seems quite important to me. I realize it's not commons, but mm -hmm. thoughts about polycentricity and the the connection with a very practical topic. And she deliberately didn't want people to, she would not accept a topic about water when she came in, it had to be something else. So I just wondered, I can see you probably had to leave a number of things out, but I wondered about the choices you had to make about what not to write about. Yes, there were a lot of choices. Um, some were practical. Um, there was a lot of stuff that I wrote that ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, just to make it a more manageable book. Um, yeah, some 
there were some topics um, that I would have liked to have written about. Um, the acequias in New Mexico, for example, and the Zanjeras in the Philippines. We had some grant proposals um, in the works to uh, travel to those places, but those didn't pan out. Um, I'd also was interested in the um, pastoralists of East Africa. He did some work there. Um, again, that uh, it would have been great to travel um, there, but uh, that didn't work out either. So there were just some practical things that I had aspirations for. Um, and then the, the municipal governance uh, topic, you know, I did leave a little bit of that into the book, but my background was in is in forestry and natural resources. So that's really where I, I came to it. Um, but it was interesting because Lynn seemed to have come to it from the other side. She was interested in governance. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that natural resources had lots, to, lots of opportunities to study different uh, systems of governance and different ways of doing it. So um, that's, I guess that's where we all kind of converge. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think this is, there's definitely a lots of, uh, lots of area to cover in future books if people want to write them. And uh, I think our work in municipal governance is um, as relevant as ever. Well, I guess, I mean, it seems to me, since you're aiming at a non-technical audience, you really had to choose stuff that would help people follow and, and absorb the ideas in a relatively straightforward way without mm -hmm. saying, oh, over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you were trying to go through, and then mm -hmm. it makes sense. Yeah, and I'm just amazed at how many uh, topics and areas she worked in in her career um, it's really mind-blowing to have that the breadth of expertise that she did really incredible so we have a question in the chat which we're a little distant to read it, yeah can we help bernie would that, yeah. would that be good yeah, yeah yeah let's do it uh, so from Hannah, yeah, uh, it says you've spent significant time in Valencia, water tribunal inscribed into Unseco intangible heritage list of humanity in 2009. Have you seen the impact of this inscription on the way the tribunal is operating or the meaning of this inscription to your interviewees? Did it change their governance? Um, yeah, so this, this water court has been in existence for over a thousand years. They've been operating. It is a great example of a long, enduring commons. Right. Um, and there is another water court in a neighboring, uh, the neighboring city, the neighboring region next to Valencia also has a water court. So um, both of them have been there for a long time. Yeah, and there is, um, you know, to answer the question directly, I did not directly study um, you know, I didn't do any original research on the water court, um, so I don't know if they have changed in their operations since this UNESCO designation in 2009. Um, but it, I think what's, what seems to have changed, according to the people that I talked to, is, um, you know, cell phones have made communication a lot easier. Um, so in the book, I talk about one canal district where it's, the tradition is, um, well, you need a key to open the gate to let the water uh, you know, flow into your canal. And uh, the tradition in one area was you write your name on a chalkboard. There's a little blackboard with this little kiosk that has the key. And you say, all right, Ernesto, for example, we meant Ernesto, he's going to get the key. Ernesto says he writes the, you know, his name there, he has the key, what time, and if someone else comes along, they know to go you know, to Ernesto's field and get the key for the, to open up the next gate. Um, so each of these canal districts has its own little tradition of um, how they communicate. Another canal district, all the farmers would meet at sunrise on the designated day to see, to determine who's gonna get the water in what order. Um, but now with cell phones, it makes it a lot easier. You don't, um, I think some of these traditions may be going by the wayside because you can just call people and, you know, on WhatsApp or, or chat or something like that. You can, it's really easy to communicate, which also makes it um, 
there are fewer conflicts, I think, because of that. Um, in the, the really old days, you know, this weekly tribunal was really the only opportunity that the, uh, the syndics, the leaders of the canal districts, uh, had to get together and talk. Um, you know, it was a big deal to come from the countryside into uh, the center of Valencia. Um, but now transportation makes it a lot easier. And now the advent of cell phones and, and chats and things like that make it even easier. So the, I think the level of conflict has come down a little bit. Um, but having that, this, the ceremony of having this water court every Thursday is really important because there are still conflicts. And being dragged in front of the water court in this very public way um, is a very strong incentive to sort out your conflict and resolve that before you do it in a very public way in front of all the tourists and all your peers and things. Um, so even though some of those, the ceremony happens very quickly, well, when there's no conflict, um, when no case is there that, that week, um, the ceremony itself is an important um, institution for um, resolving that conflict in a timely way. So we have two raised hands. So Renzo, your raised hand first. We'll let you uh, ask ask a question. Thank Attorney Michael, yes. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this is fascinating, and I've been very interested. Uh, I look forward to actually re reading the book. Uh, it's really really fascinating. Um, my my question is. Um, so how do you think, so you've been tra tracing uh, Lynn's work in detail, going to the field and all. How do you think uh, she came to realize uh, about the role of communities in the sustainable use of uh, common pool resources? Because it wasn't uh, traditional or obvious at the time and uh, mainstream economics and political science didn't support these ideas about the role of cell society at the local <laughs> level. Um, so in, as you were working on the book and doing research on her work, uh, how, how do, do you think she came to, she came up with this idea and, and actually recognizing that the role of these communities have in, in, in management of resources? That's a great question. And I think it, it really goes back to the beginning of her work as a graduate student in, uh, at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, and her dissertation her dissertation research was on the groundwater users. So um, near Los Angeles, there's the West Basin, and we've got Bill Bloomquist is here with us. So he he's, has firsthand experience with this um, as well. But there's the West Basin, uh, which is a big aquifer, and over which there are several different jurisdictions, different municipalities that were all drawing on the same aquifer. Um, and throughout the development of the of Los Angeles and its environs through the 20th century, they realized they were well. Each of these communities had an incentive to withdraw that water, to draw that water. Um, none of them had a real incentive to conserve it on their own. And it, it was the classic, you know, tragedy of the commons type of situation. But these communities figured out on their own that they did need to collaborate and did not want the city or uh, the state of California imposing regulations on them. So that really created an incentive for those communities to get together, to start talking with one another, build the trust with one another um, and start monitoring the resource and then eventually you know, cut back on their usage to a sustainable level. So that, that idea was present at her um, in her studies as a graduate student. And you know, she again, she wasn't an expert in water resources. She was coming at it as, oh, there's this interesting governance question that just happens to be about water. And then she went on to explore other governance questions, especially in, with municipal governance, and then eventually came back around to uh, you know groundwater in the 1980s with her work with Bill and then you know, other natural resource commons and then all kinds of other commons as well. Yeah. Um, so 
Yeah, I think there's a quote from her in the book where she says, you know, she had been studying commons all along, but didn't didn't really know it. Because her work on LA groundwater precedes Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. You know, that was her work was in the early 60s, and Hardin's book uh, essay came out in 1968. So she was working on this, like she said, you know, commons, the commons dilemma long before uh, it was a widespread issue. Or understood to be in that in that framework. That's that's excellent to hear. And and if I could follow up uh, um, briefly, so do you think that the methods she started answering or trying to answer her research questions mattered uh, in the way she ended up uh, discovering the the critical role of communities? Oh, I think her yeah. methods were yeah they were essential because she she really developed. I mean, there was no blueprint you know, for how to do that sort of work. And I think she was really pioneer in that um, with her colleagues here at the workshop, all of her students. Um, her dissertation, you know, it's a lot of documentation. Um, it's a lot of qualitative information about how this, these resource communities work in Los Angeles. Um, but later on, you know, she developed the institutional analysis and development framework and, you know, this method, these methods of coding, all these case studies, that really came about in the, you know, later in her career in the 80s, um, after being hooked up with that, um, that natural resource commons group with Meg McKean and uh, some of her, Ron Okerson. yes, Ron Okerson, thank you. He was one of the, the key people um, involved in that. And that, that group recognized that, hey, all these the, the fisheries people are looking at this, the water resources people are looking at this, uh, the forest people are looking at it, but nobody is talking with one another. We've got, and the, we've got anthropologists and economists and sociologists and political scientists, and they really recognize that we need a, a, a collaborative effort to bridge, you know, get out of these silos and, um, and start talking with one another. And that was, that was back in 1985, I think. And uh, that was really the genesis of the, this whole, um, this, all of our work on natural resource commons. Thank you so much, appreciate well, it. We got quite a lineup here. We got Salem, and then we got Mike, and then we got Brian, and then we got Dan Cole. And it's a... <laughs> all right. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mike, uh, Professor McInnes was ahead of me and Brian as well. So maybe they can go first. You got go the ahead. mic, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, you got the mic. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for this insightful presentation and wonderful book. I also noticed that you prepared some slides to be used in a classroom setting, which is also fascinating. So my question to you for you is, uh, how can instructors incorporate this material in their classroom environment? And, you know, what kind of courses do you see, you know, can be particularly useful for? Besides courses on governing the commons, you know, what kind of courses can be designed to incorporate this material as well? So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so uh, I did put together a sample curriculum, a syllabus, along with some uh, sample slides that can be used for each of the chapters. Um, and that's available on the book's website at the Island Press. Uh, islandpress.org is the name of the publisher. Um, so the, those materials are on the book website. Um, so I think uh, this book is a really good uh, companion to um, Andres and Jansen's textbook on uh, sustaining the commons. Um, so the, the syllabus that I wrote uh, uh, for the sample curriculum uh, blends those two together along with um, various other resources. It's really aimed at an undergraduate audience, like in, in I'm, I teach in a natural resources management program, which is very broad, uh, but it would also be appropriate for environmental studies or environmental science programs. Um, you know, more inter interdisciplinary uh, types of programs. It can also be adapted for uh, graduate students too. The book, um, you know, as a standalone, I think 
gives uh, a good overview of Ostrom's work in a very accessible type of format, but it's also a great uh, jumping off point um, for getting into Lynn's original work and that of her colleagues and some of the other books uh, that continue to be coming out. I know Vlad Tarko um, and co-authors have a brand new book that uh, just came out about a month or two ago this summer. Um, yeah, so I've developed a course uh, for my program at Grand Valley State University that I will be uh, launching next year and hoping to get students enrolled in that. And um, it's going, it'll be, you know, targeted to the students in the natural resources management program, but um, it'll be open to uh, students in any discipline because um, it really is such interdisciplinary work. I think would benefit to have that uh, students from all these different backgrounds uh, contributing to the course and, uh, and learning about those intersections of the various topics. Mike. Uh, thanks, Bernie, and thanks, um, Eric, for putting together this, um, this kind of volume. Uh, I know a little bit about how much fun it is to dig through some of Lynn's older work and, and learn about these processes, uh, sort of from a historical perspective. But I can't imagine writing for the level of audience that you're writing at. I'm kind of stuck in academies and, and have trouble sort of communicating this. So I'm really glad that you, you've made this effort. And, and Sala's question, your answer to it, really gives me another direction to go to my comment. Uh, there's a other group of classes that, that this book might be very useful for, and that's any kind of civic education courses. Uh, one of the things I was really surprised when I started digging into Lynn's former work is that she had an interest in civic education, the way students in the United States in particular uh, are taught about what governance is and, 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 and how American governance sort of works, American democracy works. And when she was president of the APSA, she made that her one of her priorities. And they had a task force that, that came out with more of a report to try to, uh, some other political scientists, try to get the civic education away from, here's the address of your congressman, here's how you can write to congressman, here's how you can contact all this, here's how elections are operated. But to look at governance more as this particip community participation and getting involved in participation, I mean, very much uh, a Tocquevillean kind of perspective on that. Uh, and and uh, uh, Dan Cole and I were thinking at one point, trying to put together a book of some kind uh, that would gather together Lynn's ideas on that, papers on that, but it was scattered and it wasn't a research topic of hers, so it wasn't that she had the same sort of level. But I really think this book that you put together, if it, if it comes across um, uh, as a whole, I've seen some of your earlier sort of versions of drafts of parts mm -hmm. of it, um, could really be useful uh, in some basic, um, even primary level school, um, um, courses about how communities can govern themselves and what it means to be a citizen in a democracy. Do you think you have enough in uh, the way you've presented this that could that could be useful for someone thinking about teaching a course like that? You know, that's a really great question. And I think, um, you know, my goal was to both inform and inspire uh, action and show that people are doing this, right? The May Creek farm folks, you know, started their own, you know, community, uh, you know, out in the woods in Indiana. And, you know, they've governed that forest resource as a, a in a collaborative way for, uh, you know, almost 50 years now. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to highlight, you know, regular people that are doing this sort of work, um, you know, in their daily lives and inspire, like, you can do this too. Um, you know, it doesn't, the book doesn't have like a blueprint for how to do that necessarily. It talks about the design principles and things like that. Um, so uh, it's not, it's not a technical um, manual on how to, you know, build a, a community governance system like that, but it does draw on these, these stories of people that have done this, they're solving their own problems. And I hope that inspires, um, you know, people to, you know, like you said, organize, you know, collaborate and solve problems in their own communities. So I think that's a really, that would be a really great use for this book. Um, I hope people pick up on that and, and use it that way. I think that'd be great. And oh, you mentioned also, you know, the difference between writing for an academic audience and a, um, 
a more broad audience. And at the very beginning, I wanted to write for a more broad audience. But like you said, I was very stuck in the academic ease uh, jargon. And it was really hard to break out of that. Even when I thought I was, you know, had broken out of it, I, I connected with this editor at Island Press who knew Lynn because Lynn had wrote a blurb for a back of a book for Island Press. So the editor actually had corresponded with her before uh, and that's really what caught her attention. But the editor told me like, no, you haven't, this is still a very academic book. And if you wanna write that, that's fine, but it's not gonna connect with other people uh, outside of academia. So it took a lot of effort, a lot of drafts and a lot of rewrites to finally find that voice. Um, and then once I got that, things fell into place. But it was it was really challenging to write in a, a different kind of way that engaged people. Because I'm not a journalist. I don't have training in that background. You should have seen the first draft of the children's book. Oh my God. <laughs> Brian. Brian, did you have your hand up? Yes, but it got answered. I was going to ask about writing to try and inspire okay. people to take action and, you know, okay. kind of well, we'll doing that Dan, and what kind we'll of action. Move on to Dan Cole then. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Eric, uh, for, the, for the book. I'm looking forward to getting my copy. Um, so as, as somebody who comes in to sort of study Lynn from the outside, outside the workshop anyway, and then you come and interview everybody. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of outsider uh, research because it can often provide uh, uh, you know, such a, a different perspective that maybe we insiders uh, have neglected or, or missed. Uh, and so I, I'm wondering, in, in your research, uh, did you come across anything that struck you as being counter to the various kinds of uh, narratives about Lynn's story that we tend to these are the conventional uh, workhouse version uh, workshop version of of Lynn. Mm -hmm. That is wow. That's a tough question. Have mm -hmm. I come across something that was counterintuitive or um. I can't, nothing is popping into my head at the moment. Um, you know, most of the people have been pretty consistent with you know, their descriptions of Lynn as a person or personality and you know, habits and things like that. Um, you know, cause sometimes you think like, how does, how did she accomplish all of this? And apparently she didn't sleep a lot. <laughs> it was that she was, you know, sleeping three or four hours a night and, uh, and really just thinking about the commons dilemma, and and that's how she was so productive. Um, is there something? Um, I I mean, coming into this, I I did not expect, I did not understand how broad her work was, and I didn't really appreciate the the commitment to democracy and self governance from like a political theory perspective. That was new to me coming from you know a, for, a background in forestry and natural resources um that was my area of interest so even though i you know came out of a policy program it was a, a very applied policy program so the theoretical piece on <laughs> governance and the work she did with vincent and the, the tocqueville tradition and all of that that was um very new to me and i that was something um yeah, that I didn't, didn't quite appreciate, I think, when I started. Yes, sir. Yeah, Eric, I hope you did not explain it when I just went out. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, I can. I have a question about how you selected these cases you are describing, because you said many of those ended on the floor and never made it to the book. So what are criteria you have chosen to say, okay, this is in and that it's not in. Follow-up question would be, I mean, some of those have been studied by Lynn, so mm -hmm. just wanted to show those groups are still functioning, 
or was there an overarching question to all the cases you present what you wanted to see with a follow-up visit? Yeah, so the, the part of it was pragmatic. Like the, the first chapter that I wrote was the lobster chapter on the, the, the lobster harvesters in Maine. That was something that I kind of knew about and it's you know a very famous case study. And it's, I think um, it really grabs people's attention when you, when you explain it to them. So that was kind of, I needed to write a sample chapter to put into the book proposal. So that's, that was my first, all right, I'm gonna write this chapter and see how it goes. Uh, you know, am I, can I actually do this? Um, so we, I went to Maine uh, with Jason Roblando and uh, another friend of mine, Christine Fennessy, who's a journalist, and she really helped, you know, walk me through how to do an interview with people and things like that at the beginning. Um, so, you know, from there, it was, I wanted to highlight some of the, the well-known cases that people might be familiar with, um, cases that pragmatically we could that I could write, like um, Jason happened to be in Spain and I said, oh, you're going to Spain. Well, I'll, I'll just meet up with you there. We could do this, you know, uh, case on Valencia. Um, so things, um, yeah, some of it was just luck uh, and serendipity. And then, um, you know, the space chapter, like my friend from running club, has a master's degree in space policy. So one, you know, this was a few years ago, we were out running and he, he tells me about space policy. And we, so we spent the whole, you know, long run talking all about this. It was fascinating. And so when it came to write the book, I was like, oh, maybe a chapter on space policies, you know, space commons. And then it turns out, you know, Scott has an expertise in space commons. So it really, a lot of things just kind of came together very organically. I wouldn't say that I had like criteria that I was trying to, um, to meet. Um, and then you just, you know, along the way, learn new things and people are applying these ideas in all kinds of ways. I met a graduate student at Michigan State University who's studying um, recyclers, the recycling community that at the big football tailgate parties People are drinking soda and beer and carbonated beverages that have a you know a 10, 10 cent deposit on all of these. And there are people in the recycling community that go around and collect all these cans and bottles. Um, well, they have different territories and they have their own really informal system of governance on who gets to collect from where and when and things like that. So she's studying, you know, she's applying Ostrom's ideas in this really brand new context. And not only is that important for MSU, but it also applies to uh, the recycling community in her home country of Zimbabwe. So there were just things that kind of came up along the way that I tried to include as well. I think just to add a point, you also were looking at a timeline. You were trying to go from oh, yes. the start to be very current. Right. So you were trying to line up things that, that flow through time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so the, I did, the book is arranged, yeah, chronologically, more or less, with Lynn's work, starting from her work as a graduate student through governing the commons and her work on global commons like climate change, and then uh, gets you in, into emerging applications. Uh, like Scott said, he, would, he didn't expect that Lynn would necessarily recognize cybersecurity as a commons problem, if you explained it at first, but I mean, she would after the fact, but that's not something that she was. That's not something that she was immediately engaged in. Uh, you know, so people are taking these ideas and uh, it's you know using them in new and emerging and relevant contexts today. Mm -hmm. You're next. Take your mask off and go. Okay. So um, it's a it's a book about Lynn, and you ask about um, you know so what was happening on. Her work on commons 1960s to 1985 to when she decided to start collecting case studies on commons so mm -hmm. that which led to governing the commons um and, and one of the main things that was happening was her work with Lynn, with uh, vincent mm -hmm. and um and because vincent was interested in commons from in his dissertation in 1950 right. so i'm just wondering you know, it's a book about Lynn, and um, so you can't go too much into to Vincent. But were you? Did you 
get into the question of Vincent and his really strong influence on how she understood um, self-governance and commons even. I talk a little bit about uh, Vincent in there. He, um, there's a call out box about his work in, um, oh, his, I think his dissertation talks about LA's relationship with the Owens Valley yeah. and how they bought the water rights. And how they influence governance, go, uh, governing structures. Yes, and his work on, I didn't, you know, it would have been nice to include his work with the Alaska Constitution and things like that. And unfortunately, no, I really yeah. mean specifically his work on commons and there they did joint. So they were kind of an intellectual team. So when I yeah. came and um, maybe it's why I'm asking the question, I came in 1989. Mm -hmm. Vincent was such a strong influence on on my understanding of commons as mm -hmm. much as 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 Lynn and maybe because he, he spent a lot of time talking um, to me and to, to other new people as well as Ron Okerson, those two were the people that I really talked to a lot. And um, so, you know, I, my, I, my memory of it is that there was such kind of an intellectual team mm -hmm. working on it, on, on commons during that time. Right, yeah, I, that's not, I mean, it's something I talk about that, you know, their relationship, you know, the, their, Lynn's dedication of governing the commons to Vincent with contestation. So I do hint at that a little bit, but it's not something I really had an opportunity to get into. Yeah. Hi, Eric. Hi, it's good to see you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hesitated to ask such a trite question. Okay. I'm gonna ask it anyway. Sure. Um, and it's about going there. As one of the hallmarks of Lynn's research was, I mean, I, I think she always had a suitcase packed the next to the door. I mean, she <laughs> tramped around, you know, the irrigation canals of every place that had irrigation canals, I think, and uh, every grassland and every forest and everything and so forth. Um, you said that you, and, and rightly, you know, obviously, correct, that, you know, you weren't researching the Valencia situation, but you went there. And you weren't researching the lobster fisheries in, in Maine, but you went there. And, and I just want to ask you for your own reflections on like what differences does it make when you go there? Oh. Yeah, that that was so important to well, I think and Lynn gets to it with her um, you know, the difference between rules and form and rules and use. And it that really gets highlighted. Like, yeah, you can read about these rules that are on paper, but until you actually go there and see how people are harvesting lobsters and look at how the traps are put together with the buoys and, you know, the whole thing, like it, it all starts to fall into place. Um, I think it, it was very, very important uh, to write this, to be able to write the book and tell the stories of the people of the resource users. It really required going to the places as much as practically possible for our book. Um, but in terms of doing the research too, like doing a real research study, you know, being able to gain the trust of the people, um, you know, so, you know, you can learn from them, you know, learn what they're doing and how they're doing it, um, you know, not just parachuting in and then, you know, going home and, you know, an extractive type of relationship. You know, you want to try to avoid that. Um, Still some limitations in working on the space comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're getting there, though. But yeah. Progress. Shatner goes right. Progress. That's right. That's right. Thanks. Go ahead. I just right, have to ask, what about that EPA grant? Are you going to go after it again? Yeah, oh, now's the time. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, that's still... So it did become a chapter in the book, and I do. I wrote a conceptual model that's coming out in a collected volume. There's a Cambridge handbook on Cameron's research, um, which I think many of you have papers in there coming out. So that'll be, I think, coming out next month. And uh, looking to recruit a student to uh, collect the data and actually, you know, go from that conceptual model to actually testing some hypotheses based on data. So yeah. 
that that project is very much alive and well. But you're not going to try to get EPA to fund it, or you are. Um, it seems to me with a different administration, but also that they need to start absorbing this concept, and mm -hmm. so they need to be pushed. Uh, so I wondered about that. Yeah, you know, that's we could take a look at that and revive it. And it was what that was one piece in a much larger uh, uh, yes. effort. So yeah, we could bring the team back together, maybe yeah. look at it. But I think people are interested. So yeah, yeah the timing is the time is right. So John, do you have your hand up? Yeah, that's right. Um, so first a quick comment. Um, teaching undergraduate forestry students governing the commons this semester. I, I wish your book had come out sooner. It would have been, uh, <laughs> would have been a good one. So next uh, next time around on that for sure. Um, but the, the comment slash question here is, I think you did a great job throughout the book kind of emphasizing uh, Lynn's point that this isn't intended as a panacea. It's not a silver bullet. So all the qualifications and caveats um, just around how complex these issues are and that it was never the intention to present this as the be all end all solution. Um, but I also noticed that there wasn't much, um, there wasn't much put forward to, to kind of draw attention to the cases where government governance institutions can actually perpetuate suboptimal social outcomes. Um, and I was struck actually the very first example in the book with the taxi drivers in Nairobi, I have enough economics background to say that sounds like a cartel that sounds like there's some dead weight loss associated with that, um, mm -hmm. or similarly with the irrigation canals and the, the role, the kind of entrenched um, privilege of property owners and the way that these, these institutions might be sustaining uh, group benefits, but only for a privileged group. So was there, was that a sort of deliberate effort to kind of keep some of the more critical stuff out of it, or is that, um, just felt like too much to, to try to bite off all at once, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. That's a really important caveat. I probably, you know, should have included more of the, you know, the, the downside, some of the place, you know, places that failed. I think one book review that came out mentioned it would have been nice to have, you know, a chapter or more examples of where, you know, the comment structure either breaks down or, you know, some of the you know, unintended consequences of, you know, maintaining power and privilege through the, these things. Yeah, I just, that was just an oversight on my part, to be honest. I, I think I could have done, a, taken uh, a more critical eye at some points with these. Um, but yeah, maybe the, the, the second edition, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll revisit some of those issues. And, and, and um, I, I know there's been some work uh, that's been like critical of some of this, uh, some of Lynn's studies and more, re you know, recently, you know, vote people have talked to, you know, Lynn and Vincent both talked about, you know, voting with your feet and things like that, um, you know, in time, terms of polycentric governance. But if you don't have the ability to vote with your feet, you know, if you don't have the ability to move uh, either economically or politically or, you know, you know, through, you know, actual redlining and segregation and things like that, that could be, that doesn't, it doesn't work. And it just, you know, entrenches that sense of power. So, yeah, those are really important points. Um, and I think I should have done a little bit more of emphasizing the downsides of this type of approach. Maybe not entirely, but I don't want to. So uh, a comment from the from me, the collaborator. Uh, I got I had the joy of reading every chapter in draft uh, once a month or once every three weeks or whatever. I'd get another chapter to read, and uh, my comment, my my approach was not to be the editor, but just to reflect on okay, what did I see that might be missing, or you know, your general pieces, and it was great fun. And as a workshopper with, a, you know, with 15 years in a workshop, it gave me a lot of reflection on lots of things in the workshop that I had not thought about in a long time. And so that made it a really fun experience. Probably in some ways, uh, the, the optimal experience for a workshopper uh, and a visiting scholar. So for, for, for that perspective, it was, uh, it was great fun. Uh, anybody else have anything they want to speak up to? 
we're getting near the time. Uh, we will leave the we will leave the, the room open for a little bit after one o'clock, but we've got to get out of the way for Bill Bloomquist to the next one. <laughs> Again, at you know at two o'clock we have Bill and and Anna on a two, so we've got to you know get out of the way. But any other comments? Go ahead. Good question. So did you? Um, this is goes along with everything. Find um, or start realizing that there were certain questions that Lynn just wasn't asking. Um, one of the questions that um, I kept getting after I got tired, but from people, but was how do you build new commons? How do you build a new commons? You know, and that wasn't really one of the questions. I mean, mm -hmm. it was it was certainly analyzing how how older commons were sustaining themselves or not, but not how you would go about how you know what tools you needed to build a new commons. Yeah, because it. I think prior to Lynn and you know her work, commons were seen as well. And I've even like I've even said this like to my classes presented commons as a market failure mm -hmm. that you know mm -hmm. uh, the market you know doesn't allocate resources efficiently, and that's something that needs to be fixed. But I think what Lynn really uh, you know, shared or the importance of the work is that comments are an intentional form of organization. Like we can do this on purpose and there are benefits to doing it on purpose. Um, so in terms of new, new commons, you know, sometimes they're, well, I think with the emerging stuff around cybersecurity and data governance and space, these are new areas where they are not, the organization is not really formed yet. Like stuff, people are doing things at the margins, but they're, you know, the governance structure hasn't solidified yet in some cases. So I think there are, those things are emerging and the story is still unfolding. I, I was just curious, Eric, now that you've written for a popular audience, was that something you'd like to do more of or are you gonna run screaming from that in the future? <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process. I liked writing, I liked talking to everyone. So I would I would definitely consider writing another book. It was fun. I hope so. Yeah. Thanks. And thank you all for uh, for coming today. I really appreciate all the questions and uh, and thoughtful comments. Thank you. So we've got uh, Angie, have you got a, a quick a comment first? I think Angie, I don't know. I thought I saw a hand for you for Angie. I I don't think so. I will I will make a quick comment that just thank you for this book. You know, since well, we're, we're getting close to wrap up time. I think you and I have talked, you know, many times and um, about this. And I, you know, we're just we're very fortunate. And I've certainly pushed out the book to my uh, networks of people. And it's, you know, one of the things that I constantly comment in various settings is that, you know, we're losing. Um, some of the historical narratives and institutional knowledge very quickly as people retire. And, and so, you know, this was, in my mind, a perfect uh, way to start, you know, capturing a lot of that. And so I, I very much thank you for that. It's a, it's a nice book to hand to people who are like, I've heard of the Ostra, you know, what is this? And, and it, it, it really captures it well. And it is quite frankly, a, a pleasant, easy read, not a heavy, you know, academic intense read, which I think also opens up access to a lot more people. So thank you for this very, very much. Thank you. Any closing comment? No, I think okay. that, uh, that sums it up. All right.